Hello, and welcome to my talk on formal verification with the Chisel Test Library. My name is Kevin Leufer, and I'm a PhD student at UC Berkeley, and I'm also one of the maintainers of the Chisel Test Library. Now, some of you might already be familiar with Chisel, but I want to make sure that everyone gets a little introduction. So what is Chisel? Chisel is a hardware construction language that is embedded in Scala. That's a lot to unpack, so let's talk about what that actually means. Well, Chisel essentially allows you to write a Scala program that generates a description of a synchronous digital circuit. This is kind of similar to how sometimes in industry people write Perl or Python scripts that generate Verilog. But instead of just concatenating strings together, we actually have a fully embedded language which has better error reporting, it has autocomplete in your IDE, and it has somewhat better defined semantics. One thing that is important to note is that Chisel is not high-level synthesis. That means that every state element in the circuit, every register, every memory, and so on, is explicitly created by the designer. It might be created for a loop or something like that, but it's still the designer has full control over all state in the circuit. So this is a very basic Chisel circuit. It's just an inverter, and it shows us the basics. So basically, every uh, module in Chisel is a Scala class that extends this Chisel base class. We can define the type of a signal. So here, for example, we have a Boolean signal. We can define a direction. So in this case, this is an output. And then we can also um, say that a certain signal is a port, which means it will be available at, on the outside of the module. This construct here defines a register which is of type bool, but we don't specify any reset values. So when the circuit boots up and when the circuit is reset, it will have an arbitrary value. Here we express a condition. So we say, okay, only when hold is false, will we assign this delay register with not in. Otherwise, the delay register will just keep its previous state. Here, we're just connecting the delay registers to the output of our module. And so this describes our small little inverter. Now, this looks very similar to things that you can do in Verilog. So what's actually new in Chisel? Well, one of the things you can do is you can actually create a bundle. So this is kind of like a record, but with directional um, signals. And now, instead of uh, in creating every uh, port individually, we can just create one single I.O. port that has all three signals in it. And this doesn't seem like a very big deal, because it's not actually much less code. But one of the cool things we can do is the thing below um, where basically we create a wrapper module around our uh, inverter, which basically just has the same I.O. Than, the, than our inverter, it uh, instantiates inverter, and then it, does, it uses this powerful construct here in Chisel, which is a uh, connect of multiple signals, basically. So we have two bundles that are of the same type. Some signals are input, some signals are output, and we just wire them all together with a single line of code. Now, the other thing that makes Chisel really interesting is that we are basically writing a general purpose Scala program. And so what that means is that we can uh, make decisions in the Scala code which affect what kind of circuit we're generating. So for example, in our inverter, we might have this uh, generator variable called ignore hold. And so you notice that this here is a Boolean, which is a Scala type, uh, as opposed to a bool, which would be a chisel type. And now here we use the ignore hold uh, variable to decide whether this uh, inverter actually has this hold pin or uses this hold pin to uh, decide whether to assign the delay or not. So here we see if ignore hold is true, then we just always assign the inverted input to the delay register. Otherwise, we actually look at what the hold, the value of hold is, and only uh, if that is false will we update the delay register. And so here, the important part that we want to distinguish is we have this if-else construct, which is a Scala evaluated at generator runtime. So this decides what kind of circuit we create. And then we have this when, which is a chisel when. So this will actually become part of the circuit. It will become a mux in the circuit. Now, what are some of the advantages of chisel? So people a lot of times stress the, 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 the fact that you can write these generators, which is important. But I think there are also like some other important things about chisel that we should talk about. First of all, one thing I really like is that you can just write reg to get a register. You don't need to just model the behavior of a register that you would have to do in Verilog. So I've had a lot of undergrads who started doing digital hardware design, and I think some of the pitfalls that you have in Verilog, they just don't exist in Chisel. Uh, one thing that's also nice is that Chisel always assumes you're making a synchronous uh, digital circuit. So by default, it will just wire up, reset, and clock automatically. 
Uh, one other nice thing is with system bear logs, sometimes there are some features which people tell you not to use because some tools might not be able to deal with it. In Chill, you can use all the features and it will all compile down to a very simple bear log that's compatible with basically all of the tools, open source and commercial. Then the other thing, of course, is that we can build this powerful automation directly in Scala. So one big example here is the rocket ship SOC generator, where we can basically just specify a list of peripherals and a list of cores we want to have, and then it just builds this network on chip and it like emits a memory, um, a memory map and everything like that. Uh, the other thing that's really nice is we don't have that many hardware developers, but we have a lot of software developers. So the tooling for Scala is pretty nice. We have a nice IDE, we have a good package manager, a unit test framework, continuous integration, and so on. And because um, Chisel is embedded in Scala, we can take advantage of all of these nice tools to help our development. Now let's look a little bit at how do we test Chisel circuits using the Chisel test library. So here we have again our inverter, and now we want to write a test. So the way we do this, is we create a new class uh, that extends a standard class from the Scala test unit testing framework. So this is the same as if you are writing any other Scala code. And then we mix in this special trait, which comes from our chisel test library, which allows us to then test hardware. Um, this is again, just standard uh, Scala test syntax for declaring a new test. And in that, we use the special test function to instantiate our circuit. And then what the chisel test library will do in the background is it will compile the circuit to a simulation and give us a handle to, this, to our design in simulation. And now we can interact with this design. We can poke some, some values into the ports and we can step the design and we can check what the outputs are. Now, if we run this here in our IDE, so here I'm using IntelliJ, you might be using Visual Studio Code or something else like that. Um, so I can run it by clicking on this green button. And now in my IDE, I'll get a result and it will say, oh, there is a failure. Like you said you wanted to see false on this output, but in, in reality, we actually got true on the output. So now how do we debug this? So the way that people can normally debug this is, well, first of all, you know the line that things happen at. So we will display a source locator here. So you can click on that in your IDE and you'll jump to the line. So you can think about, oh, what was going on there? But you might want to have some more introspection into the circuit. And so the way we do that is we produce a waveform. So how do you get a waveform and chisel test? Well, we basically just add this with annotations and we add this write VCD annotation to our test and then it will produce the VCD and the VCD will be saved in a directory that's named after the test. So basically from the test name, we can derive the output directory and then we can use, for example, GTK wave to open the VCD file that was created once we run the test again. Now, if you look at the waveform, this is, uh, it's really hard to like look at waveforms if you don't know that much about the circuit. So just trust me that there is some bug here or like some unexpected behavior. And basically if we change this uh, hold to from true to false, so we actually allow the circuit to change um, and then step, then actually our test passes. And just like any Scala unit test, we get some feedback in our IDE saying, okay, the test was started and it passed, everything is good. So this is how we develop hardware using basically unit tests that interact with a circuit simulation. Now, what I've added in the recent couple of years is I've, I've been trying to make formal verification just as accessible as these, these standard unit tests. So what would it look like to do a formal verification? Well, for formal verification, the first thing people will always ask you is what are you actually verifying? Because with a formal verification, what we do is we're trying to prove something, uh, some sort of property about the circuit. And so first of all, we have to specify something about the circuit that we want to hold. And so for our inverter, let's ignore a little bit how it's implemented and just, just look at the internal signals and try to come up with some properties that should always hold about these internal signals. So one example is uh, when hold was true in the previous cycle, so pass basically says like in the previous cycle, hold was true, then we want the output not to have changed. So that, that makes sense, right? Because like the, the meaning of the hold pin in our inverter is that when it's true, the output shouldn't change, it should hold. Um, otherwise, we can specify also what would happen otherwise. What would happen is that the output should be the input in the previous cycle, but inverted because we're having an inverter, right? So this basically specifies the behavior that we expect from our inverter. Now, what we can do is we can do the same setup as we had with our uh, standard unit test. We basically just you use the same Scala unit testing framework, you use the same chisel test extension, but then we also add in the new extension called formal. And instead of using the test method, we now have a verify method, which we also just hand our circuit to. And then the second thing, which is new, is we also handed a verification command. 
And right now, the only verification command that we support is a bounded check, which means that it will try to see if for the first n cycles after reset, there's any way to fail an assertion. So for 10 seconds after reset, it will try to find some inputs which will fail our assertion. So now if we run this, we can run it the same way in the IDE as before. Um, you see I, I changed my, my style, now it's a dark IDE, but it's the same thing as before. You just run it and you get a unit test um, re response and it says, okay, it, it, all, it all works well. Okay, so you have the exact same integration basically as, um, as a test bench and you can also use it in a Jupyter Notebook as we'll see later. And even printfs in your circuit will, circuit will work. So yeah, now let's get a, go to a little demo. I wanna show you um, some interactive demo on how this works. But before we uh, actually look at the code, I want you to understand how the design that we're trying to verify is supposed to work. So what we're trying to verify here is a simple FIFO that was written for a class and then I was uh, verifying and found that it had a bug. And we're gonna try to reproduce that same bug and then see how we can fix it. So this FIFO uh, can consist of like N registers basically, N is like the depth of the FIFO um, because it's a generator. But for now, we'll just look at it with uh, instantiated for the depth three. So if you, have, if you have the depth three, you have three registers. And if you push something into the FIFO, then we always expect the value to be in the rightmost free register. So in the beginning, all the registers are free. Now we push something into the rightmost register. We push something again, and it should end up in the middle because that's the rightmost free register at this time. And then if you pop something, then basically you take it out of the rightmost register and we shift everything to the right. So that's, that's how this FIFO is supposed to operate. And if we pop something again, then suddenly all of the registers should be empty. So that is the basic operation of this FIFO. Now let's go to a Jupyter Notebook and have a look. So this is how the FIFO looks. Uh, you don't have to um, look at the whole source code. This is all available online if you want to look at it on your own. But basically, just trust me that we have this, this register which we have defined, and now we're trying to verify it. And the simplest thing to do is we could write a unit test. So this is basically using this unit testing functionality that we were talking about earlier. With the test function here, we instantiate the FIFO, we run the test, run test basically just pushes these, these numbers that we talked about before, then it pops the numbers and then it steps. And so here we defined up here, what is a push, what is a pop, okay? So basically standard simple unit test. Now, we don't see a lot from this unit test. We don't really see what's going on. We just see that it succeeds. So now what we wanna do is we wanna have some visibility. And so one thing you can do is you can make a wrapper, just like I showed you earlier, how we wrapped our like inverter, now we're wrapping our FIFO. And why are we wrapping it? Well, because we wanna observe some of the values that go in and out of the FIFO and we wanna display them. So we're using the printf construct, which is standard uh, chisel. Um, you don't have to understand everything in here, I basically just wrote some visualization. And the best way to understand it is to just look at how it looks. So basically we're running the exact same test function as before, but now we're using this new wrapper and it will show us. And so here we see basically the same visualization as we had in the slides earlier. We have this value, which is in queued, and then all the registers are free, and then it goes into this register. So the W means this register is gonna be written in the next cycle. So here it's written. Now we, we push this, and it gets written here, and now we pop, and then we pop again, and then everything is empty. So this looks exactly the same as on the slides earlier. Now, so far, it looks like this FIFO is actually working well, and that's what the people who developed it thought. But now, um, we'll actually do a formal check. And so here, um, earlier we were like saying we have to like specify all these properties. Well, the correct functioning of a FIFO is a property that's, all, that's needed a lot. And a lot of FIFOs in Chisel have a very similar interface, where they basically have like an NQ and a DQ port. And so what we did is we made this uh, reusable verification IP called a magic packet tracker that is now part of chisel test and you basically just give it the inputs and the outputs of your FIFO and how many entries the FIFO is supposed to contain and then you just instantiate it basically in this wrapper and you can automatically then just do a formal check. So here we'll check for eight cycles after reset. And so now let's run this and see if it can find any way to basically mess up our FIFO. And it looks like it did. So let's have a little look and see what's going on here. So here in the first cycle, it's trying to enqueue zero, and it's writing it into the rightmost register. So that's great, right? So we're putting zero here. Now it's trying to enqueue this number, and uh, also to pop the, the previous element. So this works, right? So the pop is correct, we enqueued this here, and so we're dequeuing it here, so that's correct. But then what's happening is this value gets written in the middle, 
And so now we kind of violated our invariance. Now we have an empty register in the right, but we have a full register in the middle. And that's something that we didn't really want to have or cure in our design. Because what happens now is we enqueue another value and now it kind of overtakes the old value. So this value here was enqueued before this other value, but they're in the opposite order in the queue. And so now when we get the new value, it will be wrong. And so this is what it, what it notices here. It says, okay, in this cycle, I was expecting to see this value, but I got this value. And so this shows us that there is some sort of bug in our FIFO. Now, let's go back and see, see what's going wrong. Because like one of the hints here that we have, and just one thing that I want to note here is that originally it took me like probably an hour to track down this bug. So don't feel bad if, you do, if it's not obvious to you. But I'm trying to um, explain to you a little bit of how you could, you could try to track down this bug, basically. So one thing we notice here is that it is enqueuing and dequeuing at the same, same time, and that seems to cause something that then like, basically makes everything else go wrong. And so now let's go back and have a look at what is the FIFO actually doing here. So here the FIFO has like, uh, here it's the, the logic for uh, dequeuing. So when it dequeues, it will basically just uh, set some full bit to false and it will shift things. So that's great. When we're enqueuing, then we write something to the right index and the right index is just a priority encoder of the empty bit. So we'll basically look at the empty bits and to determine what's the rightmost empty bit, and that's where we will place our new value. Well, now the problem is that the dequeuing actually changes the empty bits. And, and we, here we're not looking at the result of the dequeuing after, because we're not looking at the empty bits after the dequeuing, we're looking at the empty bits before the dequeuing. And so we basically, that's why we put things into the wrong bucket. And the way to fix this is to basically special case the, the situation in which we're enqueuing things. So here, basically, if we are, sorry, where we're dequeuing things. So if we dequeue something, we will adjust the right index by minus one because we know one element is going to leave. And so we want to go one further to the right. And so now we, we want to use this updated right index here. And that's how we fix this FIFO, hopefully. Um, so we have to recompile things now um, and see what's, what's going to happen. Um, so. So here we see the test um, is the, exactly the same. Again, here you can see now we never tried out pushing and popping in the same cycle. And that was something that we just yeah didn't, didn't do. Um, but now here, if we do the formal check, it doesn't complain about anything, which means that it couldn't find any way to violate our FIFO behavior, to have a wrong FIFO behavior within eight cycles after reset. So that's great. So now we fixed this FIFO. And we can be somewhat confident that this FIFO works correctly. And so this magic packet tracker here, you can find a whole bunch of examples of it in the chisel test repository because we're actually testing it with a whole bunch of different FIFOs, which you can all basically verify with just one line of code, namely just instantiating this tracker. And that's kind of cool. Now back to our presentation. What are some of the applications that um, we can do besides verifying FIFOs, right? So one thing we've been doing is uh, I recently added some code to Chisel 3, to the Chisel 3 uh, standard library, which allows you to convert um, binary to gray code and gray code to binary. And there, the question is like, how do you verify this code? How do you make sure it's correct? And it turns out there's, there's two simple properties that can be verified uh, with a formal check very easily. So one of the properties is the identity check. Basically just checking that if you convert uh, some arbitrary value to gray code and then convert it back to binary, it should be the same. Okay, that makes sense, right? You go from binary to gray code and then from gray code to binary and then you should have the same on the output as you had on the input because the gray code should maintain the whole value. And so normally you might have to like basically iterate over all possible inputs and check that they, are, they get maintained and that there's no, no input for which this doesn't work. With a formal check, it will automatically analyze the circuit for all possible inputs. And since we don't have any state elements here, a bounded check of one is actually a full proof. And since all of this is written in chisel test, we can easily iterate over different widths. So this is just a part of an inner loop, but basically we will automatically generate a whole bunch of these checks for different kinds of widths. And this way we had a like, pretty high confidence that this gray code um, functionality would work. This is the more interesting check here. It's, uh, it's the, we're checking the Hamming distance. Um, so 
you might not really be that familiar with gray code, but so one of the properties of, of gray code or the most important property of gray code is that if you increment um, the value that goes into the gray code, then the, the output of the gray code will only change by one bit. This is of course not true if you have binary, right? So if you had like one, one, which is three in binary and you increment it to four, then it would become one, zero, zero. So three bits would flip. But here, uh, if we have the gray code, in the gray code, only one bit should flip. And so this circuit is kind of expressing this property where we're saying we have some arbitrary input A, we have P, which is just A plus one, and then we convert both of them to gray code, and then we co calculate the Hamming distance. The Hamming distance is how many bits toggled. And so basically with the XOR here, we, we get a bit vector that has all the toggled bits set to one, and then we count with the pop count how many bits are set to one, and we say oh, it should always be exactly one. And if there existed any A, for which this wouldn't work, then our model checker would give us a counterexample and say, for this A, I get a wrong value. But it doesn't, and so we have pretty high confidence that our gray code actually works and also fulfills this second important property. Not only does it maintain the values, but it also makes sure that uh, there's no not more than one bit toggling if you increment by one. Another example here is so there's this RISC-V mini CPU that some people at Berkeley have developed. Um, and it has different implementations of, of ALUs and the way that it used to be checked is that there would be a test and it would be run on the simple ALU and on the more complicated ALU. Now instead of doing that, we can just test one ALU and we can basically um, do an equivalence check. And so the way you do an equivalence check is you create an IO and you connect both the, the reference and the ALU implementation that you want to test to this IO. And then you just check that the outputs are the same um, so here this ALU has two outputs, one called out, one called that sum, and we just make sure that they're the same. These ALUs don't contain any state elements, so just a simple bounded check of one is enough to check their equivalent, and this takes only like a second or two, so it's pretty efficient and you don't need to run the tests on, on both ALUs. Another thing we've been doing is um, wh whenever we add uh, new utilities such as 3 to their stand to the standard library, so one example was the gray code that we talked about earlier, but there have also been other implementations like the Quine McCluskey decoder or this new scan left or scan right or utilities, and all of those now have formal tests. And because um, we made formal testing so easy with Chisel Test, um, it's not really much harder than adding a unit test. And so we have a lot of contributors using that. And um, because Chisel test uh, only needs uh, some additional open source SMT solvers to work for this formal testing. Uh, it's pretty easy to set up and we can easily do it also in continuous integration. So what would be some next steps? What um, could people do with this? What, uh, how could we sort of improve Chisel test to make it even easier for people to verify their designs? Um, so one thing that's a feature that's been asked for a lot and that I'm hoping to push forward in the future at some point is um, something similar to system variable -like assertion sequences. So these are basically declarative descriptions of um, multi-cycle behaviors. And um, these are very popular in industry, but right now there are no good open source tools to use them. The only one that I know that really works with formal verification is um, the GHDL compiler for VHDL. It has, um, it has a capability to export their PSL assertions, which are similar to system variable -like assertions. Um, it can export them to Yosis, and then Yosis can basically give that to a model checker. Um, but if you're not writing VHDL, if you're writing Chisel, there is no good solution right now. So one thing that we know about Chisel is that it can be pretty easily extended with um, Scala libraries. So one thing we could do is we could actually probably implement these sequences as a library. So we could just have a library of these sequences that you can instantiate, and that are then mapped to basically the state machines that check these sequences. So that would, be, that would be pretty neat, and I think that's something that's definitely feasible to tackle over the next couple of years. Uh, one of the challenges will be that um, ideally we would want to be able to target all the different simulators and backends that Chisel users use. So this includes several open source simulators, but also ideally commercial simulators. And we also shouldn't forget about the FPGA accelerated fire sim and the formal verification that I just presented on. So yeah, as I said, I have some people working on this, um, but we'll see, it's, it's definitely a challenging problem and it will definitely take some time to get this working. Another thing that's kind of interesting is um, people are interested in uh, tracking whether information flows from certain pins to other pins. And um, this is also something that could potentially be checked 
pretty easily with a chisel based solution. Because we have a nice compiler, we have Fertile that's easily extended with compiler passes written in Scala, um, you could write an information flow tracking pass. And then using the formal verification support that we already have, you could actually use a formal checker to prove that for at least for a bounded amount of cycles, no information will leak out of your design. Um, I had an undergrad student working in this with a small prototype, um, but right now the problem is we don't really have enough um, good examples of like what people actually want from this tracking support. And there are some trade-offs which are kind of hard to explore. Um, but maybe someone from the community is also interested in this. Uh, other things that are missing that are like, uh, I think, smaller projects is that we would love to at some point have a proof interface where instead of just saying like, oh, for this many cycles, there is no failure where we can say there will never be a failure, basically, no matter how many cycles you executed for. And the easiest way to get there is there are actually like model checkers um, that can do proofs. We just need to engineer a good user interface for them. Um, that's, that's the main challenge. Um, the other thing that we are lacking right now is the chisel cover statement is not supported. So right now we cannot generate traces to cover statements. And there are also some solvers that we still don't support yet. For example, there's the Pono uh, model checker from Sandberg. Well, so that was my talk on uh, agile formal verification with uh, chisel test for chisel. Um, so basically I introduced a new verification, a formal verification support for chisel. The, it has pretty easy verification setup, and there are counterexamples that are replayable from a Scala unit test, so I hope you will check it out and I hope it will be easy to use. Um, it is already used in some of our Chisel unit tests for the Chisel standard library, and I think there is a promising future here because with the Scala embedding and like the Fertile compiler, we could pretty quickly prototype what, what the industry calls formal apps. So basically like um, applications that, that are sort of more complicated than just simple assertion checking. Um, yeah, feel free um, to join the Chisel community. So we have uh, the Chisel GitHub. We also are pretty active on Gitter normally. Um, I did a lecture also that goes a little bit into more of the details on formal verification. So you can check that out if you want under this link. And all the examples that I have are also open source and, and available if you're interested. Now, I'm happy to take uh, some of your questions. Thank you very much.